Hello everyone, welcome back to Karn Academy. My name is Karn and today we're going to be talking about disorders of the esophagus. I hope you're all doing super well and are kind of settling into your rotations. Um, so today we'll be talking about a few things. In terms of, I guess, importance for your examinations, we'll be talking about gastroesophageal reflux or GORD, which is G-O-R and G-O-R-D, which are big topics. Then we'll be talking a bit about Barrett's esophagus, cancers affecting the esophagus, esophageal motility disorders like achalasia and diffuse esophageal spasms, and then some other conditions that are known to affect the esophagus. So let's start with what is the esophagus. So it's a muscular tube from C6 to T11. Do not need to know this. Um, you, I guess, anatomically, we keep learning about the esophageal hiatus. That's a T10. You need to know about the two sphincters. And I think this is really important anatomically. I also realized throughout this presentation, I keep spelling esophagus differently. So we have O-E and then we also have E-S. Please bear with me. Um, it, uh, American versus British. It's a big, I don't know. Sorry about that. You have two sphincters. You have the upper esophageal sphincter and the lower esophageal sphincter. So the upper esophageal sphincter is the one you control when you swallow. And that's going to be of skeletal muscle. The lower esophageal sphincter is this one right here that's present as it herniates through the or passes through the diaphragm. And that kind of prevents the, or is meant to prevent the reflux of gastric contents up into the esophagus when the stomach contracts. And as you can imagine, incompetence of the lower esophageal sphincter is going to result in GORD. Now, what are the normal mechanisms? Well, we talked about the contractility of the LOS and how that prevents GORD. And the other thing is obviously going to be the gastric acids themselves. So the two main reasons why you can have GORD are either going to be you have too much acid or too much irritation of the gastric mucosa, or you have an incompetent LOS. And when we talk about our causes for gastroesophageal reflux, this is what it's going to be. So you can have too much acid due to things like spicy foods, fatty foods, alcohol, caffeine, gastric ulcers, medications like prednisolone, NSAIDs, all those are going to cause um, excessive levels of acid production. You can also have the incompetence of the lower esophageal sphincter where it's not constricting as much as it should and therefore allowing gastric contents to pass through and upwards. So things like paraesophageal um, herniations are common. Stress apparently is a big one. Pregnancy, because as you can imagine, with increased intra-abdominal pressure, that's going to push the esophagus up and prevent it from contracting adequately. You also have medications like doxycycline and bisphosphonates, which are notorious for causing um, issues at the lower esophageal sphincter because of their role with um, smooth muscles. And also, both of these medications can cause esophagitis or irritate the esophagus, which is why they're very specific dosing regimens when we take these medications. For example, one that's important to know is bisphosphonates. So when you give someone a lendronate, you say that you should take this in the morning with food, food to prevent irritation or excessive irritation of the gastric mucosa and the esophagus. And you should remain upright for 30 minutes after eating or after taking the medication. This is because if you lie down, the odds of gastric contents passing back up and causing reflux and esophagitis are going to be much higher, which is why you take your medication and you stay upright for 30 minutes. So now the question is, apart from, I guess, just pushing forces, why is the transient lower? Why is the, um, so what is, so we talk about normal relaxations and then we can talk about pathological stuff. So Normally, obviously, your low, lower esophageal sphincter is going to relax, right? That's how your food is going to enter the stomach to begin with. As the gastric contents are undergoing digestion, they produce gases, and this gradually dilates the stomach. And this is undesirable. You don't want to have that excessive gaseous production. And therefore, the LOS occasionally relaxes, and this is called a transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation, to release this, th these buildup gases. However, if this happens too often, and now you have a situation where you're not only letting out gas, but also food, that's going to cause gastroesophageal reflux. Now, what's the difference between GOR and GORD? It depends on how severe it is and what symptoms the patient is having. 
So if it is affecting their day-to-day -day functioning and causing distress, it's typically called GORD um, versus GOR, which is the, the symptomatic um, reflux that many of us would probably have. And in patients with excessive um, relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, and in about two thirds of these patients, you would have concurrent acid reflux. So how does this present? I'm sure this is something you're familiar with. So I'm gonna go briefly into a few important points. So it can present with retrosternal chest pain, a burning sensation, acidic taste in the mouth, which is when it comes up, obviously gastric acid is gonna cause that acidic taste. You can also have reduced appetite and excessive salivation. Now, why do you have excessive salivation with gourd? If you think about it, um, for anyone who's <laughs> had a big night out and thrown up, if you remember, and I'm sorry for bringing this up, right before you throw up, you feel as if you're, you're salivating quite a bit. This is your body's natural defense mechanism to excessive acidic injury. So when your body senses that you're about to throw up or you're about to reflux, it causes increased secretions of saliva to protect your mouth and the upper esophagus from being damaged by that acidic secretion. Halitosis, which is bad breath. You can also have progressive dysphagia, hoarseness of voice, and nausea, vomiting. At this point, we also worry about some other conditions like cancers or bad esophagus. And we talk about this in a second. So how do we treat this? The first thing we'd like to talk about is lifestyle changes. Please always mention this. Diet modification. Reduction, reduction, reduction in caffeine and alcohol intake because we know both of these promote acid secretion. Smoking cessation, physical activity, weight loss. Weight loss is a huge one, especially for a god. And obviously not eating right before bed because they're going to be eating and lying down and it's easier for gastric contents to pass up if it's horizontal. If this doesn't work, you have a few medications you can use. Depending on the severity, you could use antacids, which are just a medication that counteract the acid secretion that has already been produced. So it doesn't actually lower the acid, it just neutralizes it. This is mostly used for patients who have the occasional bout of reflux, but it's not really severe um, and doesn't affect their activities of daily living. Then you have PPIs or proton pump inhibitors, which actually reduce the um, acid secretion. And examples are isomeprazole or pentoprazole. Next, we have Barrett's esophagus. So Bats esophagus is a transformation. So what, what do I mean by this? So it's a metaplastic transformation. What happens is you have this junctional zone called the Z line, where you have squamous cells and you have gastric mucosa, right? Gastric mucosa is composed of columnar epithelium, while, which is secreting acid. And then you have your stratified squamous epithelium up here. We have this zone of transformation, this, this zone of basically transition between the two. When you're when you reflux quite a bit, what happens is you start to damage this part, which is normally stratified squamous epithelium. Columnar epithelium is much better at handling acidic content well, because it produces acidic content, right? And therefore your body thinks, well. The stratified squamous isn't doing much. What if I converted this into, into columnar epithelium? Well, it would help my symptoms and will protect me a bit more. So what you have is you have a transformation of one cell type to another. This is called metaplasia. And this transition is from stratified squamous to columnar. This inherently is not dysplastic, which means it's not cancerous. However, this transformation does increase the risk of dysplastic transformation. So remember the difference. Metaplasia is just change from one cell type to another. Dysplasia is when you have abnormal looking cells, which is a precursor for malignancy. Here's the normal esophagus, and this is that Z line of transformation of uh, transition that I talked about. And here you can see you have areas of transformation. So you have here all the red looking mucosa is transformed. Now let's talk a bit about esophageal cancers. Now this is a bit of a big one. You have two types of esophageal cancers. You have squamous cell carcinomas and adenocarcinomas. Now, how are the two different? 
Squamous cell carcinomas tend to present in the upper one third of the esophagus, adeno in the lower one third. How does this make sense? We know that, okay, before I jump onto why, how does that make sense, I'll tell you that squamous is linked to smoking and adeno is linked to Barrett's esophagus. Just knowing that, well, it would kind of make sense, right? Because if you're smoking, the part of the esophagus that's going to be exposed is going to be the upper part, so upper one third, versus Barrett's, the part that's going to be affected is going to be the lower one third. Additionally, the squamous cells, as we know, are going to be present in the upper one third. You're not going to have columnar epithelium, and therefore any cancer is not going to be an adenocarcinoma, because adenocarcinomas are usually cancers of adenoid tissue, which is typically columnar. Versus, as we know, with Barrett's esophagus, we already had a metaplastic transformation from stratified squamous to columnar epithelium. This columnar epithelium can then transform into preneoplastic disc changes through a process called dysplasia, and this can eventually lead to an, ad to an adenocarcinoma. How do these present? Well, the typical cancer symptoms would be weight loss, fatigue, anemia, but then some things that are specific to the esophagus include dyspepsia, Progressive dysphagia, and this is important, so it's progressive dysphagia, which means that they start off by having um, difficulty swallowing big pieces of meat or big chunky foods, and this eventually gets worse and worse and worse where they can't even swallow liquids. You can also have bleeds with these. As you can imagine, they are hypervascular and they can bleed presenting with hematemesis, which is throwing up blood, or if it goes the other way, you have malina which is um, just digested black stools. How do we investigate this? We can do a barium swallow. We can do something called an esophageal gastroduodenoscope or duodenoscopy, uh, which is a mouthful, but basically put a scope down. And then if you do see something, you can do CT scans and PET scans to assess for progressive stage and, and stage them, and then take a biopsy for grading. Now, the treatment is highly dependent on the type, location, and stage. Unfortunately, most of these cancers, as you can imagine, to cause severe enough symptoms for them to present is going to be usually stage three or stage four, which means that metastatic disease is quite common with esophageal cancers at presentation. If, however, it's a stage one or stage two picked up on routine gastroscopy, you can do what's called an endoscopic submucosal resection, where you just cut out this part. And you can also do localized radio and chemotherapy. Um, however, as you can imagine, with more advanced lesions, you would have a more supportive and palliative approach. Why did I have that? Sorry, extra slide. So what are esophageal motility disorders? Wait, what is this? Sorry. Sorry, extra slide. I duplicated, but didn't edit out. Never mind. So esophageal motility disorder. This is a rather low yield topic with two important conditions you should know very little about. Achalasia and diffuse esophageal spasm. The two are similar in how they present, but very different in what's actually going on. So let's talk about what each one of them are. Achalasia is where your lower esophageal sphincter fails to open up. It's a hypomotility issue where you have increased autonomic supply to the lower esophageal sphincter and it just doesn't open up. As you can imagine, the person is going to eat food and it's going to be stuck, quite literally stuck at that, at that lower esophageal sphincter. And that's going to present with symptoms. Compared to that, we have diffuse esophageal spasms, which as the name suggests, the esophagus, as you know, is a muscular tube. And if it intermittently contracts abnormally, that is called diffuse esophageal spasms. The exact cause is unknown, but it's considered to be autonomic dysfunction, as I mentioned. Investigations to consider include manometry, where you can actually put in a probe to measure the exact pressures. And this can tell you or give you an estimate of what the pressures are at the lower esophageal sphincter. And you can also do barium swallow studies, and we'll talk about this in a second. Treatment is focused on lifestyle changes, very similar to what we've already discussed. And then you can also use medications to induce relaxation of muscles like calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. If that doesn't work, you can perform surgical interventions like Botox, which injected in areas 
reduce nervous input and therefore can cause relaxation. Um, and you can also do a lower esophageal myomectomy where you cut through the esophageal sphincter to open it up a bit. And this is obviously going to be resolved, reserved for later stages. So as you can see here, all you talked about what achalasia is. So it can be either primary or secondary. So primary is just, we don't know what's going on, but diseases like Chagas disease, which we talk about later, and gastric cancers can present with achalasia as well. And it presents with intermittent dysphagia to liquids or solids. So unlike cancers, which is going to be a chronic progressive picture, this is going to be intermittent, right? It's not going to be progressive. And it can be to either solids or liquids, which is different to cancers. The barium swallow is going to show this. So as you can see, this is the lower esophageal sphincter, and it's very, very narrow. It should be ideally opened up a bit more. And this is kind of that bird beak appearance. Think of it like a bird hanging upside down. This is the beak. It's called the bird beak appearance. Barium swallow, achalasia. Good buzzword to know. Next, we have diffuse esophageal spasm. Again, intermittent dysphagia to liquids or solids, non-progressive, intermittent. A barium swallow would show a corkscrew esophagus, which is what this looks like, and it does look like a corkscrew. The next one that's not really a motility issue, but is, I think, an esophageal condition that's important to know is plumber Vincent syndrome. It's this very rare and probably never going to be assessed for you guys condition that occurs in people with long-term IDA or iron deficiency anemia. It presents with a triad of IDA, dysphagia, and upper esophageal webs. Now, what is an upper esophageal web? As you can see here, this is an upper esophageal web. Why is it called a web? I really don't know. But what it basically is, is a protrusion of the esophageal membrane into the esophagus. And that would cause food impaction, which is why you get the dysphagia. And well, that's the esophageal web. It also presents with atrophy of the trunk and, and angular chelitis, which are both features of IDA. And as you can see on a barium swallow, this kind of is the obstruction, which is what you're seeing here, just on a barium swallow. And that's all we had for disorders of the esophagus. Thank you guys for coming. I hope that made sense. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to message me or send me an email. And yeah, as always, please look after yourself and please look after your loved ones.